everyone. How are you? Still hangover, huh? So um, it's really a great pleasure for me to be here. I'm really under time pressure. I have been told that I have only 20 minutes to give you a story of a big company that has a big supply chain that is doing something big for society, for the planet, and that's my challenge. But hopefully you will engage in my presentation and we'll have enough time for questions so you can sort of take something home that can actually make a difference for you. Yeah, that's my purpose today. And that purpose starts with the understanding of where we are. Let me see if this works. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Do I need to point to the sky? No. I'm clicking. OK. Good. So um, all of you read newspapers, right? And you all see what's happening in the world. We're having a, a society that is actually complaining about multinationals. You have inequality. You have people on the streets of Kiev. You have people on the streets of Rio. You have people on the streets of, uh, in, in Turkey, in, uh, in many parts of the world, somehow complaining that there is inequality out there. And actually, the capitalism and the way companies operate is also being challenged. Are you taking too much profits? What are you doing for society? Are you only thinking about your own benefits, short term? What about long term? What is your role for climate change? Are you actually taking natural resources from the environment to fulfill your growth and profitable ambitions, being very greedy and not necessarily building a future for the next generations? What are you doing about all this? What are your companies doing? And in my view, we need to take a leadership role here. And that's what Unilever is trying to do, to understand how can we lead a change that will engage you as well as you use our products, but we also keep growing our business and satisfying our shareholders, because they also want to have dividends. They also want us to make profits. But more and more, companies are being challenged to play a role that is meaningful in society and that is meaningful for the, meaningful for the environment as well. And that's where we are today, trapped in this sort of difficult and very conflictual environment that is changing dramatically, and you're part of that change. You are driving this change as the next generation, the people who are making your voice being heard through social media and many other type of means. And that is also happening at the same time as we keep, if this doesn't work, we'll have, do you have another one? No? Batteries are not working. So I have to do this, see if that's... Sorry. Ah. You have to turn it on, that's important. <laughs> so that happens also at the same time as, as we see our consumer landscape, shoppers, you using our products, changing dramatically as well. The demographics of the world are changing, and I will not take you through each of those points. But the reality is that we see more and more need for differentiated, personalized products. Let me give you an example, not in my industry, but something that might happen to you. If you go to France, you can actually go to an outlet store and actually have a scan of your body, and it will take actually about 20 or 200 different positions, and it will actually tailor exactly your body and you can actually have a very well tailor-made, perfect for your fit shirt for 49 euros. Yeah? The farmer's market is changing in the US. People can actually start now ordering on the web fresh tomatoes and vegetables that will actually be linking to the farmer himself, and they will actually deliver these fresh products to you, generating zero waste of foods in the agricultural supply chain. And you get fresh products, and the retailer that is collecting on this takes only $3 for that commission. So demographics are changing, but also personalized needs are, are coming up. At the same time, with a lot of pressure on pricing, we have recessions, we have difficult economic environment. Amazon alone has been demonstrated by retail analysts that has changed 2.5 million times the prices that they have in their products per day around the world, per day. So pressures on price are very high. People are starting now comparing prices. You have them all available on the web. And all this happens at the same time as corporations are expected to convey trust, transparency. 
What is what I'm buying? What is behind your supply chains? I'm sure some of you bought some meat from a retailer here in the UK thinking that it was beef, but it was horse meat. <laughs> so how can we ensure that we control our supply chain in a way that you bring value, like good prices, with values as well, in the way you offer your products in their supply chain? And that's where Unilever fits. It fits within these complex, volatile, ambiguous, and sort of changing and uncertain environment. And the question is, how can we have a successful business model that allows us to grow whilst we also play a meaningful role for society and for the environment? That's our business model today. And that's the business model that I'd like to share with you. It's a business model where we want to double the size of our business in the next 10 years or so. We've been in this journey for three and a half already. Whilst at the same time, we generate no impact, additional impact to the environment, we reduce our carbon footprint, and we increase our social impact for society. So we want to keep growing without borrowing more natural resources from the planet and make a meaningful positive impact to society. That's a challenging task. It's a challenging goal that we're actually having in our business. And you ask yourself, how can you do that? Because you grow your volumes. You keep expanding products that you use, detergents, uh, shampoos, uh, teas, uh, dressings, uh, you name them all. And can you, can you actually grow that fast, double your size without necessarily letting the planet realize that so we can hand over our business to the next generations without having a planet that is much more stressed and actually creating so much issues out there. And we're doing that by increasing our efficiencies in the supply chain, which is my responsibility. I'm the chief supply chain officer of Unilever, and I'm the guy who actually is looking after everything that moves in the company from the way in which we procure our products in agriculture, services, packaging, all the way until we put the product on the shelf, which is the one you buy. And the challenge is how can we make this model work? By increasing efficiencies, which is what you see on the right side of the chart, that will allow margins to grow so we can invest more behind our brands, advertising so you can be aware of our brands, we can invest in innovation, that will allow us to grow, create some critical mass, which will make us even more efficient, and we continue that virtual circle of growth as we have our brands, our people, and our operations within the center of that model, which is what we call sustainable living. How can we ensure that after 125 years of history, we can continue projecting trust and a business model that is successful so the next generations can continue buying our products? And this is a huge company. It's a company that serves about 2 billion people per day. I'm sure that 95 or 99% of you have used a Unilever product this week. I'm sure about that. You might not realize what kind of product that is, but we are more and more projecting ourselves with our brand on TV so people can realize that it's a multinational behind that is trying to sort of position itself to make a difference. 190 countries, it's a big, big company, big brands. I will not spend too much time on that, but it's huge. And I'll describe what supply chain is behind that. And this company obviously is pressure for margins. I have to stand up in front of analysts and investors to convince them that it's a good business if you buy our shares. It's a good business if we keep actually investing in this company. So at the end, you can have your returns. And that is actually demonstrated through margins, free cash flow, huge amount of cash that you can see there, and trade working capital that keeps being more and more negative so we can have a, a healthy management of our cash so we can keep buying other companies, keep investing in capital, and keep growing our business. That's part of my responsibility as well. Now, how can the supply chain enable this growth? And that happens fundamentally through a very complex system, and I will not spend too much time on this because I like your attention in something that changes your lives every day. But it's a huge operation. Our products, raw materials and goods travel, the equivalent of the distance between the planet Earth and the moon, tw back twice every single day. That's as big as operations are. 250 factories around the world, 440 warehouses. We produce 130,000 tea bags per second. At this point in time, there are millions of tea bags already being produced as we talk. 1.2 billion Magnum ice creams per year in three factories only in Europe. 
it's a monumental, huge operation. And when you sit on top of that operation, you, uh, you ask ourselves, how can we make a difference for the business? How can we make a difference for the planet? And how can we make a difference for society? What is our purpose as a company? What is our purpose? What are we here for? Is it only to squeeze our KPIs and increase our margins and grow the business? Or is it more for a purpose that actually can make a difference out there? It's about a company of 174,000 people and about 113,000 are reporting to this supply chain monster, which I'm happy to lead. So I have many challenges out there. But what takes me out of, day, out of my bed every day, which is why I came here on a Saturday after having a very intense week, is to make sure that we're actually doing something that is meaningful, that is making a difference out there. And my goal is to prove to you or to convince you at least that there is a company here that is trying to do something different. This is a company that is across many categories. And just to project the complexity of our supply chain, take Indonesia, for instance, a country of seven or 11,000 islands, depending on the sea level. That country actually has products which are going from the very premium end of the brands in personal care, like Tony and Guy, that you can see here in the UK, for instance. But also, it produces in personal care products very basic you know, uh, skin cleansing products, which are at the very bottom of the pyramid, for a category specifically. Then you go into the country itself, and you realize that you have very premium products for, say, for face. And at the same time, you have products like detergents, which are costing for five washes less than a phone call for the consumers. And that happens across many geographies in the country, which is so complex, where the distribution logistics in the, uh, in, in the city of Jakarta are fundamentally different to the outer islands, where we have to still distribute and have a product out there, where, by the way, prices and margins are even higher than in, in Jakarta itself. And this happens across many channels. The drug channel that is very profitable, but also the mom and pop stores, where you do find products on the street from the modern trade to the very traditional trade as well. So how can you manage all these supply chain in a way that is efficient for the business and that makes a difference? And these are only a few examples for which I will fly very quickly. We have a factory in Italy that is exporting about 72% of the products around all continents. And these are food products. And these are products that allow us to grow both the top line but also the capital efficiency of our business. We also have in Nigeria a factory that has world-class standards. So there is no second-class citizens in Africa. There is no second-class supply chain and manufacturing standards in Africa. We're producing at world-class technology levels, and that allows us to grow and double our size. But we're also producing detergents in Europe, here in the UK, that are being exported to South America, in Chile specifically, allowing us after 130 days since we took the decision to have the products on the shelf. This is a truly global supply chain that is leveraging scale for the best of the business. But we, our success as a business, which is something you study for sure, is how we can grow the business through innovations. Speed is a currency. The fastest we put the products on the shelf, the more chances we have to actually gain market share. And that has to happen also with high levels of availability and service. So we can ensure that when you go to the shelf, you find the products there. And that also actually happens along the lines of a very strong industrialization program where we're actually building 30 factories around the world with very high standards at the speed of almost eight to 10 months for each of these factories to come up. Whereas in the past, it used to take two to three years. So we're investing fast because we want to grow fast. And we want to have route to markets which are very competitive but other people cannot go and actually make a difference for the business. We also work a lot with our suppliers because they're part of our network. They're part of our system. And they do add value if you start innovating with them more than just squeezing their margins and prices. When you ask them to invest in capacity for you, so you avoid your capital, but they also grow with us, you actually create value by asking them to collocate their plans together with our factories, to provide advanced services in all ty types, and also to provide food security, like is the case from Sunrise, where we have an agriculture program together with them in Madagascar to produce sustainably vanilla so we can ensure that farmers are actually making uh, their own better lives. They actually have their own profits and their own uh, businesses with us 
through the supplier in a sort of way that is very sustainable. And that's also a very important program that we manage in order to create value. And these people are actually involved with the same purpose that we have. We have the so-called Partner to Win program where they join Unilever to see whether they can also help within their own businesses to make a difference for the planet with a very strong purpose. And that's the one that I'd like to share with you. That purpose is along three dimensions. First of all, we want to help more than a billion people to have a sustainable life with you know, high standards of well-being and also of health hygiene practices. We have a personal care business that is very important in many of these countries, like Lifebuoy is a brand that Lever Holme, our founding father, actually established here in the UK. During the Victorian times, we had many issues in London, which were actually slums in the Victorian times. So there was a guy who was very visionary who said, I need to create skin cleansing products soap bars that can actually allow people to be much more hygiene and actually avoid death because of lack of hygiene standards. Now we have actually expanded this mission across the world in many countries where we go. As I said before, even though we want to grow and double the size of our business, we want to have today's environmental footprint that we have as a business, and I'll come back to that in a minute. How can we do that? How can we be bigger, take more volumes, and still have a less impact to the planet? And how can we source 100% of our products in agriculture in sustainable agricultural practices? So the soils actually remain fertile, and more and more agriculture can happen with higher yields and less use of natural resources like water, for instance. So it's a very bold ambition that we have, which is part of our business model. It's not corporate social responsibility to look good and convince you that we're a good company, but it also brings business value for us, and I'll show you what that means. Many, many impacts and many, many efforts to actually transform our supply chain. One million less tons of CO2 have actually have been uh, less, uh, you know, released to the environment. 27% of the energy we use is actually coming from renewable sources. We have managed to save two liters of water for every habitant in the world in the past three years in terms of the, the consumption of water in our factories. Three quarters of our factories actually dispose no waste to landfill. And you can see many more of those uh, purposes, there. like 50% of the agricultural goods that we buy today, that we source, are sustainably harvested. Two thirds of the packaging material we use, on paper in particular, come from recycled or sustainable sources. And it's quite a, a big, bold ambition. But all that represents about only 30% of the carbon footprint that we generate as a business. Suppliers, raw materials, our industrial footprint and our transportation represent about 30% of the carbon footprint. The rest happens when you use our products. When you wash your clothes, when you take your shower with hot water and lots of water, and that is actually what generates even more sort of strain and more consumption of these natural resources. And the question is, how can we minimize that impact as well as a business, even though it's beyond our walls? And we see this as a business model, as I said before. If you take detergents, for instance, consumers and shoppers are very much willing to actually buy much more concentrated detergents. Why? Because it's convenient. You don't have to take a big bulk of liquid products to your home. It's very convenient. Customers like it because they have more shelf space to use, and the returns of our products are actually much higher. We do bring innovation, because actually that is part of our business model. Shoppers actually, with these kind of products, actually need to use less water. And you might say, well, why should I care that much? But in the developing and emerging markets, many women, unfortunately, have to walk 3.5 hours to get buckets of water to do their laundry. And sometimes they have to choose whether they do their hair, and wash their hair, or they wash their clothes. So if we get a convenient proposition to them that allows them to use less water, they have a better life. But they also actually end up using our products. So we can grow and at the same time reduce the environmental footprint. So for them, climate change is something they don't care about. What they do care is water availability. And we have products that allow them to use less water and still have a better life. By having smaller products, we actually reduce our costs. And all this comes together with an internal inspiration for our people that understand they are making a difference to the planet. We are very inspired. There are 174,000 people in Unilever who are truly inspired 
by this program and this strategy because we know that we're helping the planet somehow. And that is actually what happens also in the field of agriculture. These are pictures that I've taken myself when I go around the world. These children are from Tanzania. When we landed there, they actually for the first time saw a helicopter. They didn't know what actually a big sort of flying thing was all about. And we're actually expanding with the Tanzania government our tea states so we can create sustainable development for these poor people in Africa that have parents that live with less than one dollar per day and still allow us to have food security, high quality teas, which will allow an ecosystem that at the end will be sustainable, both from a business point of view and environmental point of view. 50,000 people will be positively impacted by this program, which I'm very proud to lead. We're also changing the palm oil industry by putting all these growers together and tell them, you now have to commit to zero deforestation, zero use of peatland, and zero exploitation of people and communities out there. And they're now about to sign a manifesto that will say, yes, we do commit to zero deforestation. So what is what the end, what this embracing purpose is all about? This embracing purpose starts with the logic of thinking about electromagnetic fields, waves and bands that you don't see. So if you think about cost alone as a company, you will actually be minimizing your impact. So better infrastructure, if you focus on the management of waste, will actually allow a greener planet to happen. And that will help farmers and people to develop around the world, as we also ensure that we have food security in our supply chain and our business. And this is, at the end, what our story is. It's a story where we want to really commit as an organization to grow successfully within the model of a capitalism, but at the same time, making sure that our products, our services, and the way in which we manage our supply chain is sustainable for the long term. And I will leave it here. So please, your questions, your challenges, your ideas, because we do care about them. Thank you. So, first question, so I'll, I'll facilitate that, yeah? Hi, Hi. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I was just wondering, um, it sounded very interesting and very impressive, um, the efforts your company is taking, but I was wondering, how do you compare yourself to basically your competition? Is, um, how, do you, how is your standard of uh, sustainability efforts compared to other, other companies on which you compare yourself to? Well, that's obviously leading to a very biased answer because they're my competitors. So at the end, uh, we feel that we're always doing better than them. But the reality is that many multinationals now are starting to realize that they need to do something for the environment. They need to do something for, for society. Why? Because that provides food security and raw materials and feedstock security. Um, I do believe that there are many companies that have genuine in intentions to actually help uh, the ecosystems that are around them. But we do believe that we're the sole company so far that has been able to combine the purpose of growing the business substantially as we want to double it, and at the same time, reduce our environmental impact by decoupling the two of them. If you ask a company, tell me what your energy impact, your energy consumption is for your business, they will say, well, it's gigajoules per ton. So the more we produce, the less energy we use. But still in totality, in absolute terms, they keep actually creating more impact to the environment in terms of carbon footprint. We have actually given ourselves the challenge to decouple them. And to our understanding, there are not too many companies that are doing that. In some fields like agriculture, we want to join forces. If you don't want to change the palm oil industry, you cannot do that alone. So we're collaborating with other companies to make that happen. Yeah? But all in all, it's a trend and it's a movement that is starting to happen. And many companies are catching up. Because they do realize that when you buy a product yourself, you do care more about the brand that is behind that product. And you want to make sure that that value that you get for the products you bring home also has a company with high values as well. Okay, just a question there. 
Um, I like the conglomerate um, Unilever. I just want to say that. Um, also, I just wondered, um, how does um, your global supply chain affect infant industries, infant suppliers? How is affecting other industries? Yeah, like infant industries, like smaller companies, smaller businesses. Yeah, we, we yeah, sure. The, um, but part of the commitment that we have is to actually improve the lives of one million smallholder farmers. These are very small entrepreneurs, very small companies, very small uh, families who are actually trying to have a living behind agriculture. And that's just one example that I can give you that is very engaging and very inspiring because we can get actually more benefits by having suppliers that are committing to better agricultural practices that will increase their yields as their input cost in pesticides, fertilizers actually reduces. And by providing stability in the supply with them, we improve their social standards, there is sustainable development, and actually at the end we both win together. So we, we do have 10,000 different supplier companies around the world, but more than a million point five, if not even more, smallholder farmers that are directly connected with us. And our purpose is to make sure that we do grow together with them because it both has a business benefit on one side, but also has a very social purpose and an, and an agricultural purpose as well. Thanks. Perhaps back there? I still have five minutes, right? Yeah. Good. Uh, again, thanks very much for your talk. Um, the, the whole goal of reconciling profitability and sustainability is very honorable. And uh, it's very impressive that Unilever is trying to do that. But um, ultimately, in many cases, there's a trade-off between profitability and sustainability. Can you mention any specific examples where Unilever <coughs> has implemented something that has improved both of those things? Yeah. I, I think, you're, with all due respect, your assumption is wrong. Because ultimately, you can achieve better sustainability with also better profitability at the same time. In some specific examples, you might have some trade-offs. Like palm oil, if we want to buy sustainable palm oil, we have to pay a premium to the farmers so they can actually have different harvesting practices and agricultural practices. But all in all, that generates a huge amount of saving for us because they will produce more, there'll be more supply, and at the end, the prices actually will go lower. So uh, in the industrial system, I've been able to save more than 200 million euros by investing in technologies that allows me to use less energy, less water, and that they're much more efficient. So some people will say, yeah, but we need to invest capital, and my cost in the factory will increase. But when you take the ultimate aggregation of all your practices and all your initiatives, you end up having a profitable business that is also sustainable. And that's why the two come together at the same time. Yes, if you ask me to ship ice cream from Europe into, uh, into North America, as we did, in that specific route, we might have an increased carbon footprint impact. But our business will grow more. And overall, when I take my total network, I've been actually being able to increase the volumes and the growth of our business. And in totality, we have reduced the travel that our products, the distance our product travels around the world by 2%. So you can actually decouple them and gain business benefits and also sustainability purposes at the same time. You had a question just close to you? Uh, yeah, my question was kind of related. Um, I was wondering about because when you have a more diverse supply chain producing in many countries, that is often beneficial for your costs. But on the other hand, you obviously have the trade-off that you need more transportation, more transportation steps, which increases yes. carbon emission and so on. Do you know the Fiji water? Have you seen the Fiji water? It's a sort of square bottle that looks uh, very nice. It comes from the Fiji Islands in North America. Have you seen that? Raise your hands if you know Fiji water. So that Fiji water, do you think it has a less or a higher carbon footprint impact than a water that is produced locally in the US? What do you think? Raise your hand if you think it has a higher impact or a lower impact. Because it has to be brought from the Fiji Islands to the US. Yeah? Obvious, right? No, it's not obvious. Well, the carbon footprint that that Fiji water actually generates, according to MIT, for the environment to be land in the US is lower than producing a bottle of water in the US. Why? Because the energy produced in the US is actually coming from coal. And the carbon footprint that that generates to blow the bottle and to distribute the, the water locally is higher than shipping bottles from Fiji Islands to the US. Why? Because the energy produced in the Fiji Island is renewable. 
these are the new paradigms and the new logics that we're actually living to today. Yeah? There are like a hundred more questions, and it's your choice whether you want me to leave or you want... Okay, I think we have one short question. One Thanks. short question. So, here. Anyway, thank you very much for your insightful speech. Uh, um, but I just want to um, um, point out a theory that I've been hearing a lot lately about uh, the MNCs and how they affect environment, uh, societies, and so forth, and multinationals. Uh -huh. um, yeah, good, it's yeah. a theory that I do not really agree with, but I just hear it like um, as a counter-argument to the free trade and all this. Uh, and it's about the wealth that is being generated in these societies, as you said, in Tanzania and all these right. African or uh, non-industrialized societies. Um, and that the wealth that is generated there is leaving the countries. As you said, the countries do produce something and they make a value out of that. But this value is actually fleeing the country. It is coming to the consumer societies mm -hmm. in Europe or the States or the advanced societies. What about this value that is leaving um, the countries? Uh, are we still talking of a sustainable development or is it going to be something like a transfer of the value produced in these societies to the advanced world? Thank you. Listen, um, I was in Davos uh, a week ago, and I met with many heads of states from Ghana, Tanzania, Kenya, uh, Rwanda. All these heads of states see sustainable development and public and private partnerships as the best and most effective way for them to grow their GDP and to actually have a better society and a better sustainable economic model. Of course, you end up investing in Africa because Africa is growing in terms of economic benefit. But there is no way that you can actually believe that by only extracting raw materials and resources from these countries, you can actually have a sustainable business for the long term. We do believe that we, as my Tanzania example shows, that by partnering with governments, civil society, NGOs, and other private sectors, you can actually develop a sustainable business that is for the best of the economic development of the country for the standards of living of the people in Africa or in Asia, and still it generates a very attractive business for you as a multinational. So when next time, I'm sure one day you will actually end up going to Davos, you will hear a lot about pro public and private partnerships, and that's what we believe we need to do in order to create sustainable development for these nations. It's not about handing out money anymore, but about investing for the long term so you can have a business that grows sustainably and profitable for the long term. And I truly believe that's the case. OK? I wish you all the best. Keep thinking about what is, what is the company behind every product that you buy. And make sure that you understand the role that you have to play in society and for the, uh, for the planet itself. It is by sticking all together and raising your voice as a young generation that you will get very far and you make a difference to the planet and to society as well. So thank you very much and I wish you all the best.